Okay, welcome to this week's Read This Next with Miss Laura and Miss Nicole. Um, make sure to check out our past two episodes um, of Read This Next. They are on our YouTube page and on Facebook. Uh, so today we're going to be doing books that fall, books that were written by Indigenous authors because it, because it is National Indigenous History Month. Um, so we'll get into those in just a sec. Before we get started, I just wanted to um, let you guys know that the books we're talking about are all available on Cloud Library, which is the Thunder Bay Public Library's ebook and e audiobook platform. Um, so you can get on Cloud Library and access these materials. If you need help, then you can email us at comments at cbpl.ca, or if you need um, help getting a library card or updating your library card. If you don't remember what your pin is, um, just give us a shout by email and we will be more than happy to give you a hand. Yeah. All right. Then let's pop right into our highlights for the week. Um, we've got four and then we have some recs that we've read. So I'll get right into that. So our first one, uh, as you know, we like to do some teen and some adult ones because teens is for everyone. Adult is for whoever wants to read them as well. Um, so our first one is Marrow Thieves by Cherie Dimelin. She's a Métis writer and activist from the Georgian Bay, Georgia, Georgian Bay Métis Nation in Canada. Um, this book sounds pretty cool in my opinion. And this is what the cover looks like. We didn't have, cover. I know, we didn't have covers last week because our printer wasn't working. This and week you can see, it. like, that is a hugely award-winning book. Absolutely. Look at all those awards. Yeah. That means it's really good. Canada Reads, uh, GG Books, The Kirkus Governor Prize. General. Oh, Governor General. Okay, Amy mm -hmm. Mathers and Code... I can't read that much. It's very tiny, but it won several <laughs> awards. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll describe it. Um, in a futuristic world ravaged by global, global warming, people have lost the ability to dream, and the dreamlessness has led to widespread madness. The only people still able to dream are North, American, North America's indigenous people, and it is their marrow that holds the cure for the rest of the world. But getting the marrow and dreams means death for the unwilling donors. Driven to flight, a 15-year-old and his companions struggle for survival, attempt to reunite with loved ones, and take refuge from the recruiters who seek them out to bring them to the marrow-stealing factories. Um, I started reading this one la this week, last week. Um, it was interesting topic, not my style of writing, but it was, it's, it has the, I think if I keep reading, it, it'll get better. It was very very cool idea just a different style of writing for me it was a little more fast-paced than I'm used to but it was still I, I can't wait to see where it goes I um, have actually read that one did I you read like it, it? yeah I did I read it a couple of years ago like there's so many um there's so many dystopian books out there mm -hmm. and sometimes they can start getting a little bit samey yeah <laughs> enjoy them you can start to start seeing like oh this one has that same trope and this one has that same trope but because this is, um, this author is able to, like, she's really centered her culture and their cultural beliefs that it's able to be, like, a kind of, just a really original, like, full of sort of new ideas, of new ways of looking at the probe. So it's, I really enjoyed it. It's good. It is a very quick read, like, as you yeah. sort of said, fast me. I think it's it was, like, 250 yeah. words. Yeah. Pages. Pages. I was like, words? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> It is quite a slim, it is a slim book. It's a quick read, but I think it's, um, I think it's pretty powerful. So I'll have to finish it then. Second, second to that recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next one that we had was going to be This Town Sleeps, but we highlighted that um, by Daniel Staples, but we highlighted that in our Pride episode, so go check that one out. Um, the next one is Johnny Appleseed by Joshua Whitehead, who is an OG Cree storyteller from the Pegui First Nations in Manitoba. Um, and I, I believe he's also identifies as uh, in the LGBTQ community. The he author. does. Yeah. Okay, so this is what the description is. You're, oh, I'm going to try, good, try that again. <laughs> You're going to need a rock and a whole lot of medicine is a mantra that Johnny Appleseed, a young two-spirit slash in, indigi queer, 
repeats to himself in this vivid and utterly compelling novel. Off the reserve and trying to find ways to live and love in the big city, Johnny becomes a cyber sex worker who fetishizes himself in order to make a living. Self-ordained as an indie and glitter princess, Johnny has one week before he must turn, return to the res and his former life to attend to the funeral of his stepfather. The next seven days are like a fever dream. Stories of love, trauma, sex, kinship, ambition, and a heartbreaking recollection of his beloved Kokum, grandmother. Johnny's world is a series of breakages, appendages, and linkages. As he goes through the motions of preparing to return home, he learns how to put together the pieces of his life. Johnny Appleseed is a unique and shattering vision of Indigenous life full of grit, glitter, and dreams. Which sounds so in I know, I'm super intrigued. Like, glitter? <laughs> glitter? <Okay>. What? <laughs> yeah, the premise sounds kind of cool. Um, the next one that we have is very famous in Thunder Bay. Oh, wait, I forgot to show you the cover for Johnny Appleseed. There we go. I will say I'm a little bit disappointed that it doesn't have glitter on it. Yeah, the I mean, beadwork is very nice though. Like the, it's very nice cover. The feet are a little bit sparkly, but not. <laughs> That's okay. We can't always get what we want. What we want. And also, <laughs> this one says on it, it was the Governor General Books Award finalist and the Scotia Giller Prize long list. Again, big deals. Yeah. Big deal Canadian authors. Absolutely. This next one, like I said, national bestseller, RBC Taylor Prize of 2018 winner, or I guess recognizing excellence, and the Writers Trust of Canada uh, Prize winner. Um, and this one is called Seven Fallen Feathers, which many Thunder Bay e ins <laughs> have read. Um, so, Seven Fallen Feathers, Racism, Death, and Hard Truths in a Northern City by Tanya. Talaga? Talaga? Talaga. Tanya Talaga. I knew I was going to get at least someone's name wrong. Um, wrong but... Either way, she's, she's, I think, come here and spoken about it a lot, too, at the library. She's been here. She did a, a big talk at the auditorium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's been pretty involved around town. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is the description for this. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, in 1966, 12 year old Cheney Wenjack froze to death on the rail tracks, railway tracks after running away from a residential school. An inquest was called and four recommendations were made to prevent another tragedy. None of these recommendations were applied. More than a quarter of a century later, from 2000 to 2011, seven Indigenous high school students died in Thunder Bay, Ontario. The seven were hundreds of miles away from their families, forced to leave home and live in a foreign and unwelcoming city. Five were found dead in the rivers surrounding Lake Superior, below a sacred indigenous site. The description lists the people that uh, passed away. Um, and then it says, using a sweeping narrative focusing on the lives of the students, award-winning investigative journalist Tanya Tel Telega delves into the story of this small northern city that has come to manifest Canada's long struggle with human rights violations against indigenous communities. So it's a bit of a heavier read but it's worth reading because it, it does tackle a topic that Thunder Bay is working on. Yeah. Okay. Put away the picture. Uh, the next one is Those Who Run the Sky, which is a YA one, but it's the, I, like I, I keep saying this for all books that we talk about, but the idea is just so cool. Okay. It, it has to be mentioned. Okay. Those Who Run in the Sky by Aviak Johnston and a Calloway-based Inuit author. Okay, okay, here we go. Uh, this is a coming-of-age story that follows a young shaman named Pitu as he learns to use his powers and ultimately finds himself lost in the world of spirits. After a strange and violent blizzard leaves Pitu stranded on the sea ice without his dog team or any weapons to defend himself, he soon realizes that he is no longer in the world that he once knew. The storm has carried him into the world of the spirits, a world populated with terrifying creatures. Black wolves with red eyes, ravenous and constantly stalking him. Water-dwelling creatures that want nothing more to snatch him and pull him into the frigid ocean through an ice crack. As well as being less frightening but equally as incredible, such as a lone giant who can carry Pitu in the palm of her hand and keeps caribou and polar bears as pets. After stumbling upon a fellow shaman, 
who has been trapped in the spirit world for many years, Pichu must master all of his shamanic powers to make his way to the back, make his way back to the world of the living, to his family, and to the girl that he loves. So that one's pretty cute. I think that one's on the the YA shelf in Cloud Library yeah. this month. Well, so that's where you can go find it. Yeah, go check it out. Now I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna turn it over to Laura for her rec for the week. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Laura. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, I decided that I wanted to highlight the author Louise Erdrich, who is, I mean, not like she really needs my help. She's very well known, <laughs> but just in case you didn't know, I haven't heard of her somehow. She's a really great author, um, very well known literary author. Like she's been writing for many years, um, you know, wins tons of awards, um, very well respected. Books are often best selling. Um, they are truly excellent though. And they're not, they're, I think sometimes there's a bit of a stereotype of literary reads as being like maybe more dry or not as engaging, but that's really not true with her books at all. They tend to be very um, sort of almost conversational. There's a lot of humor, which is, you know, often that's very typical for a lot of Indigenous writers, right? Because like humor is such a part of their culture. Um, so there's a lot of humorous characters. There's a lot of um, just like the personal relationships going on. Um, her books are really, they're a lot of fun to read. Um, so her most recent one is called The Night Watchman. Mm -hmm. I believe it came out this year, if I remember correctly. Um, if not, then very late last year. It's quite, it's quite recent. Um, don't love the cover. <laughs> Do love the book so far. But I did have to, I did have to, you know, put that out there. I did have to admit it's not my favorite cover. Um, but so this is, this one actually is, uh, is a historical as well. Um, so historical literary. And it's actually based on the life of her grandfather. Okay. Yeah. Um, and he is the, he was the titular Night Watchman, which is the name of the book. Um, and he worked at, as a night watchman and carried the fight against native disposition from rural North Dakota all the way to Washington, DC. Um, so it follows actual historical events with the, her, the character of her grandfather, but everything around it is, um, is fictional. Like she's made up the other characters, um, other members of his family, the people, his coworkers, all that is, okay. uh, is fictional, but she has, so it's sort of a, um, you know, a combination of biography and, and fictional novel. Um, it's really great. And it's, it's one of those, she tends to often have a, a big cast of characters. Um, so we, we have the Night Watchman character, Thomas, and what he's going through as he's trying to, he keeps his job and he's also a Chippewa council member who's trying to understand um, this new emancipation bill that's on its way to the floor of Congress, it's 1953. So he's, he's from, from far away, he's trying to understand exactly what the point is of this bill and what they're trying to accomplish. And then as he becomes more, um, you know, he, he comes to understand what exactly they're trying to do, now he has to try to find a way to, to block it, to stop it from happening, because it's meant to be um, an, an emancipation bill is what they call it, but it is really a termination that threatens the rights of Native Americans to their land and their identity. Um, and it's asking like, how, how can the government abandon treaties made in good faith with Native Americans and the quotas for as long as grasses shall grow and the rivers run? Which may sound, that phrase might sound familiar to you if you've ever read that Thomas King's Green Grass Running Water. Uh -uh. Um, really excellent book as well. Anyway, so that's one of our characters we're following is, is Thomas. And then we're also following um, a young woman who's 19 and she works on the reservation has a job in the factory where thomas is the night watchman and you know the things that are going on in her life and she wants to um her well her sister is missing in minnesota she wants to try and find her she's worried about her her mother her brother her father is you know not around much and when he is around everyone wishes he wasn't one of those um we follow them but then we also follow like all these other characters um and so you can kind of see it's one of those things where you you get to know a character and then you follow another character who interacts with the first one and you have this like sort of um, this inner track knowledge. You understand why that other character is acting that way because you've 
you've spent time with them already. That's cool. I always love that kind of thing where you're, yeah, where you're getting to know the people and how they fit together in the community. Um, really, uh, I'm, I'm about a quarter in, I guess, um, and I'm already really engaged, already really pulled into the world, which is something Louis Erdrich does so well. Um, and so it's, uh, they, the, the themes are um, like love and death, lightness and gravity, and uh, it is, as always, the, the description says that it has elegant prose, sly humor, and a depth of feeling of a master craftsman, which I think is all, it's very true, um, as fancy as those things sound. It's also just like a, it's just a, a really great read. Um, tough, some tough topics, certainly some difficult things to hear about and to think about people living through. Um, but lots of really, there's also some really inspiring parts, right, which is just like real life, right? There's always going to be things that are hard. And then there's also going to be people who inspire you and lead you to all sorts of interesting things and ideas and experiences. Um, yeah, recommend this book, The Night Watchman. Re recommend all of Louise Erdrich's other books, especially I have to give a special shout out to The Last Report on the Miracles at Little No Horse, which is one of her books from years ago. And I think that's the first one of hers I read. It is so funny. <laughs> it's really good. Very good indeed. Anyway, that's mine. That's my rec for this one. That was like five recs in one. It was great. <laughs> it was mostly just, just read Louise Erdrich. That's the main <laughs> point of that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay, so my rec is. The Ghost Collector by Allison Mills. Um, it's pretty short. It was about a hundred, I want to say 114 pages, which isn't really that much. But if you're into quick reads, that might be, if you're into quick reads, that might be a, a good thing. Um, it was about uh, a young, a young girl, younger than I would say YA, uh, honestly, but the story was um, it's about grief, really. So it's, it's a universal message. Um, this girl and her grandma, they collect ghosts in their hair. Um, so they, they go to people's houses that are haunted and that usually it's little creatures like, um, a, a bird that flew into their window and all of a sudden it doesn't realize that it's dead. So it's flying around the house and it's knocking things over. So they have to catch the bird and then they tie it in their hair, then they take it outside and then they let it go because they are there to help ghosts pass on. Mm. Yeah, it's really cool. The idea was really, was really nice. Um, yeah. And then the, the main, the turning point really is Shelly's mom is suddenly killed in a car accident. And she can't understand why her mom's spirit isn't there because mm. they do help people as well. And she's like, where's my mom? Like, I should be able to see her. How come she's not coming for me? Because her mom also was able to see spirits. Um, yeah, so she, she talks to other ghosts. She starts uh, dealing with her grief in a more negative way, also involving ghosting. Um, and then ultimately figures it out. And it was, it was a nice, it was a sweet ending and I, I really liked it. Um, but I'll just read the quick description at the very end there. Um, so rooted in a Cree worldview and inspired by stories about the author's great grandmother's life, the ghost collector delves into questions of grief and loss and introduces an exciting new voice in tween, oh, tween fiction. That would be why. Uh, that will appeal to fans of Kate DeMillo's Louisiana's Way Home and Patrick Ness's A Monster Calls. Yeah, so I really, I really liked it. Excellent. So we had some more good reads to recommend for you today. <laughs> <laughs> and we invite you to go and check them out on Cloud Library. Um, they are available, so you'll be able to get on there, sign them out, place holds if you need to. They're worth it. Absolutely. <laughs> Worth waiting for. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> keep an eye out next week. Um, I think we've decided our topic will be zombies. It will be zombies. Yeah. Yay! Yay! Okay. <laughs> so we will see you guys all next week. <laughs> Bye! Okay, bye!